Well, those are some tough acts to follow. Uh, we, I was telling Anna that this is one of those moments, uh, the, the old children's show, where it was like one of these things is not like the others. Um, you've seen three pretty great examples of what I would call intensive agriculture. You know, even a dairy is much more intensive, and uh, ours is more extensive. So in, in Montana, we have big skies and, and uh, big acres and not many people, and we'll try to show you some pictures so, of, of what we do. Yeah, so what we have is um, about 30 slides. I brought you some eye candy from Montana, the big sky country. <laughs> so uh, bear with us. We couldn't decide what to pair out when we took the train. Um, and we know we're standing between you and Black Beluga um, goat cheese salad. So um, I'll just t tell you one thing. I just Thank you so much, Iroquois Valley, for being part of our scale up effort. I mean, it's not just about growing food for Doug and I, it's about this land stewardship revolution that we have to have across the northern Great Plains of the U.S. So you're going to see more of this in our presentation. But if you want to read more about us or this, this uh, grower that moved into becoming timeless seeds that's our lentil buyer, there's a great book out. It's called Lentil Underground. The author is Liz Carlisle. Liz grew up in Montana and then uh, went to Harvard and then studied under Michael Pollan. So Lentil, Lentil Underground, check it out. Um, Lentil Underground. Yeah. So don't believe everything it, you read. It was but. on the New York Times list for <laughs> a number of months. Not, not because of us. We're in Chapter 11. But anyway, <laughs> you'll, get to hear, you'll get to read more about this cast of characters that exist in the Northern Great Plains. So with that, Doug, you got it first. So we just wanted to give you a little idea of where we are in the world. Um, we are in north central Hill County, Montana, northwest of the town of Haver, immediately below the Alberta-Saskatchewan border. Uh, next slide. So just for some perspective, we're roughly 1,500 miles northwest of Iroquois County, Illinois. <laughs> and. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Hill County, our, our county, uh, the total population of the county is 16,000, and the county is just under 100 miles wide and 75 miles tall. <laughs> we live, the farm headquarters is 40 miles from Haver, uh, which has a population of 9,800. We're 150 miles from the nearest town of any size, which is Great Falls, and 100 miles to Medicine Hat, Alberta. Uh, in our area, the typical crop mix is wheat and not wheat. <coughs> uh, <laughs> we, uh, our county has, according to the last census of ag, 800 farms. Average farm size there is just under 2,000 acres. Um, most commercial farms are, are 10,000 plus acres. Um, typical farmland value is around $1,000 an acre with some variance for, and, and Maybe most importantly, our annual rainfall is, on average, which we never get, is 11 inches compared to uh, Iroquois County. I'll just let those facts speak for themselves. And, and the background picture is actually kamut, which is an heirloom grain, interseeded with flax. So we're doing a lot of interseeding. Uh, this is a, a farm layout map. Uh, we farm what we call four separate units. Uh, the different colors, the yellow is where our headquarters and our, our home is. We have a section, a quarter there. The uh, lavender color is uh, what we call the Nature's Path unit because Nature's Path Cereal Company bought that land and, and leases it to us. Uh, the green uh, started off with what Ann and I purchased in 2008 to start the farm. And uh, number three up here is the yes. Iroquois Valley Farm, which they have given a name that I can't pronounce, but. Uh, we call it the Iroquois Valley Farm. <coughs> um, the orange is our, our most recent unit. We lease a farm down here, and the ones in Crosshatch are the next ones that Iroquois Valley is going to buy and lease to us. <laughs> they don't know that yet, but that's the plan. <coughs> Anyhow. So, yeah, that was in total uh, 6,600 acres. We're Right now, as of today, without the next purchase, we're farming uh, 5,600. And uh, of that, we till about 5,000 annually. Yeah. 
So 27% of our farm is in non-crop conservation, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, a lot of other conservation activities, which is so key to our farming system. Um, let's see, I was going to say something else. Anyway, anyway the, the other piece on this slide is that actually in Montana, there's 18 million acres of cropland. Less than 1% of that is certified organic. So if any of you want to come visit, I would love to show you the difference between our farm and how it looks as opposed to our neighbor's farms who spray from fence row to fence row, middle of the county road, which are two tracks. And we actually have field borders and things growing. Um, organic we see as like this huge opportunity for the Northern Great Plains. We're importing over half of our organic grains. It's a $47 billion business. What is it that people are not understanding? And actually, what I was going to say before is on the map, previously, like we've been able to expand not just because of folks like you, but we now have landowner neighbors calling us that are saying, you guys are doing pretty good. What's, what are you doing? What's your magic? Um, cycle so we have some opportunities for even further expansion well and not only is it that that we're having some success but wh where we are is just depopulated Th there are fewer people in the county where we live than there have ever been even before european settlement there were more people there and it's one of the least populated places on the planet we're up there with siberia and alaska and <laughs> So part of our effort is not only do we farm, but we have a, an apprentice program, and I'll talk some more about, but we're hoping in some small way to rebuild community by teaching people to farm and helping to incubate them then on to a, a viable farm unit. So part of what we do is we bring people to the farm so we can have some community. So this actually just happened uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, a couple fun gals from Xerces Society. So we've seeded by next year 270 um, intentional acres to native pollinator habitat, which I think may be the most of any farm in the US, actually. So anyway, you ought to try this. Like, try being a bee once in a while, and I'll show you some. <laughs> so yeah, we do a few corny things, and the dogs, of course. Um, we have no kids, just three Jack Russell Terriers, and they're on rattlesnake patrol right now. <laughs> Um, okay, so this might be a little hard to see, but I wanted to give you the big sky picture of Montana. This is actually on the Iroquois Valley Farm. That's Doug and our two Xerces Society um, staff out here in the 60 acres of native rangeland that we left and did not crop on your farm. And they're out there looking for bugs. So if you have ever hung out with an entomologist, you really got to check it out. And, <laughs> you know, just fun. for clarification, in case you're wondering, native rangeland is land that has never been tilled or plowed. This is as it, nature intended it, I guess. So part of our monitoring was to say, hey, what's going on in those, the places that we seeded and native pollinators versus what might be happening on this native supposedly untouched land. So I'll just give you a few pieces of of fun bugs. So here's a um, blister beetle. Here's two other guys. This is a native um, Bombus huntai, uh, Montana bumblebee on the left, and on the right is a sweat bee. And have you ever looked up close? Like, check out the pollen on this guy. The sweat bee? Yeah. Like, that's pollen. Like, he, she or he is packing that around from flower to flower. So that was also off of um, Iroquois Valley. Go ahead. Um, here's Doug checking out some of our heirloom emmer. You want to say anything? Go ahead. Now, that, that's on the farm as well. Yeah, Those are um, uh, black beluga lentils that Rusty's scouting. And these are all crops on the Iroquois Valley farm. There were tilling in the uh, sweet clover green manure crop. Um, we grow our basic rotation as a five-year plan. We'll harvest three crops out of those five years, and the other two years we incorporate uh, green manure to build soil. So this was also on the Iroquois Valley farm. So last year we grew durum, and we underseeded it with sweet clover, which like came up, and then this year grew and became our green manure that we fed back to the soil. So one of the challenges this year is we've had a lot more rainbows than we have rain. Um, <laughs> <coughs> you know when. <laughs> When normal is 11 inches, it doesn't take much off of that to make you into a real desert. But uh, uh, we're still going to have some harvest this year, but definitely below normal. And uh, 
but we still get to enjoy some of the views. Well, and the prairies have always been very variable. So part of this is how do you build soil? How do you build a, a system for yourself on your farm that's resilient to those variabilities? But I'll tell you, talking to some of the old timers, we have seen much greater variability in the last few years than ever before. Last year, we had 23 inches of moisture during the season. The year before, we had two. And so trying to be a farmer and work within those um, efforts. So, you know, people can talk to me all day about climate change, and I'll tell you a real life story. Go ahead, Claire. Um, here's another piece of our conservation plan. If you ever look at our farm on Google Maps, you can totally pick us out because we are not giant <laughs> fields of monocrop. Um, this is actually. <laughs> Was that a Freudian <laughs> slip? I must be hungry. <laughs> this is part of the. Uh, <laughs> this is also on the Iroquois Valley farm. Um, so you can see our crop strips. So uh, this, this first strip here is actually the sweet clover that we were plowing down before. Everything on our farm is laid out on 240 foot wide crop strips with 20 to 30 to 50 feet of border in between each of those that we're reseeding to native pollinators or we've enrolled in the CRP program. So we're getting some sort of base uh, ecosystem service payment for those. Those strips actually provide wind erosion control, they provide snow catch, they provide habitat. Um, so that's part of our whole farm design, kind of agroecology on a big scale. Anything else you want to add? Uh, here's just a picture of one of the field borders with the tractor and the speed tiller. So um, anything we can do to feed critters. Yeah, we, we established those with various, um, mostly native, but flowering plants that are designed to keep something blooming throughout the, the season and give the pollinators something to feed on that, that whole time. Another project we've done is uh, try to rehab a windbreak that's near one of our bin sites. So uh, this cow, this was Shauna, our apprentice last year. I think she'd been there for two weeks and wondering what the heck she was doing. But <laughs> anyway, this is also in our CS. We have used extensive USDA conservation money. Um, sustainability to us is more than just our cropping system. It's about how you live and show up on the planet and what resources you use. This is our photovoltaic system that we had grant funded with uh, rural development funding from USDA two years ago and we've been net zero electricity at our farm headquarters since then. Um, we're also the first the first grid intertie system on Hill County Co-op electric system, and they were all like, what the heck are you doing? But anyway, that, that's a whole nother story. The electrician came out and had heard in the break room that Shania Twain bought part of our farm. So <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just let people keep talking. So. <laughs> you gotta drive out there, Steve, and then we can make people talk yeah. more. One of the other projects we do, um, kind of a community exercise, we have two neighbors with feedlots and they didn't have a way to use the product of that feedlot. Uh, and uh, one that's friendly came up and visited us a few years ago and said, you know, I, I understand you're organic. Would you have any use for this manure? And I smiled and said, certainly. And so every year <coughs> we rent a trailer and use our truck and remove about 2,000 tons of um, beef feedlot manure that goes into our rotation. In one of those green manure years, we also add the, the feedlot manure and that allows us to meet the phosphorus needs of the following three crops and build that soil and organic matter. And uh, we made his problem into a solution for us. Well, he's now using our spreader and putting some of it on his ground. And these are not like your Nebraska big feedlots. These are feedlots where they have their cattle out on the range all year and they just bring them in in the winter to feed. So we wanted to talk about uh, tillage and machinery. We have a, a kind of an array of various tillage implements that are integral to our system. Uh, all of the land we farm the start was was either in the conservation reserve program uh, or, or had not had been in pasture basically when we started so it had been not cropped for a minimum of 20 years so we were basically starting with sod so we uh, did initial soil tests and measurements and then we began farming and implemented our rotation. We used either this heavy disc or the next picture is a moldboard plow when we did our first breaking. And uh, we do soil tests regularly, at least every fifth year in our rotation. And we have been able to build organic matter, uh, perhaps despite doing tillage, but I would say 
partially because of it, because the tillage allows us to implement a diverse rotation and to incorporate those green manures into the soil rather than leaving them lay on the top where they, they do much less good. Um, tillage to me is the art of farming and uh, I, you know, it gets a bad rap today, but if you use the right tool at the right time and, and uh, use it in a manner that allows you to incorporate a diversity of biology back into the soil, then it's got to be part of the solution. So this is a uh, really a revolutionary tool that, that we just bought earlier, well, last year and, and started using in this spring. It's called a speed tiller. It's actually designed and built in Australia. And this machine uh, allows you to cover a lot of a ground because it goes nine miles an hour, but uh, it also will work very shallowly and incorporate residue and size it so that it's easy for the biology in the soil to break it down and leaves enough in the, on the surface to avoid any erosion. So it's just a technology that really works for us. This is another one of our tools. We pull a combination, a, a, a sweep chisel plow followed by a coil packer. Again, that operates fairly shallow, but also uh, by the coil packer, it, it leaves the soil in a condition that's much less vulnerable to erosion. That's our main air seeder. We have two units, but this is the bigger one. We seed uh, that one's 60 feet and the other is 36 feet at a time. This is what's called a noble uh, blade plow. This we use to terminate green manure crops that are shallow rooted. That machine, it's really amazing. I wish I had some better pictures, but uh, when that undercuts, there'll be a little, like a knife strip, and that's the only thing you can see in terms of disturbance. And in two days, everything that was, was growing in green turns brown. You've left all the, the uh, surface residue to keep, keep the soil protected and, and all the root matter is, is underneath and, and dies off to, to build soil. And that's just a picture of our combine uh, from last year. Oh yeah, so we just try and have a little fun here too and everybody has to remember to stretch and do your downward dog breathing. Thanks for the terrier break. Um, one of the other things we do as an activity on our farm is advocacy. Um, every May, it's not the best time of year to go, but as part of Organic Trade Association, there's a week-long policy days in D.C., and you get to go meet with USDA representatives. Um, this is Senator Tester. We are so lucky in Montana. Um, he is the only organic farmer in the Senate right now, and he's practicing. He's the only farmer, farmer in the Senate. In the Senate. <laughs> he to be um, and he is a real meal deal guy. Like, we've shown up at auctions, and Tester, will be, you hear this booming voice, Crabtree, what are you doing? And he shows up in his car heart so you know it's really fun to go lobby when you talk to him because his staff already has everything figured out and then he can prep you for what to say to other senators so um. Uh, we also bring a lot of people onto the farm. This is a growing partnership we have with Montana State University. Um, on the right is Max Burgess. He's an instructor in the School of Agriculture, and those are two of his students. We're hoping that Kaylee, in the middle, she's getting married and finishing her degree in Sustainable Food and Bioenergy Systems, is going to come work with us next summer. Um, so part of our apprentice program, because we thought, like, man, this is so cool. There ought to be lots of other people that want to do this, too, right? <laughs> and, and unfortunately, I hear Shannon's story about, like, people coming out of the woodwork, and I'll tell you that hasn't been our experience here. And I think <laughs> part of that is because, A, we're really rural, and, B, you know, we have tractors, and we might be viewed as industrial agriculture, but we also have this amazing land stewardship story that we have to do something different about in this country. So we have three types of apprentices. The first one's New Agrarian for younger folks. Um, that's a partnership with Cavera Coalition out of New Mexico. I can tell you more about them, just Google them up. The second one is we are the first registered agricultural apprenticeship in the state of Montana. We worked with the Department of Labor for that. So, you know, if you want to be an electrician or a plumber, you sign up for a two-year program, like this is it. And we actually have funding through another beginning farmer rancher partner um, grant with USDA to fund a veteran to come be part of that program for three years and do a case study. So if anybody knows somebody that's really interested in relocating to Montana, send them 
our way because we haven't found that. The, la the last piece we have is entrepreneurial opportunities. So as we said, we have a lot of acreage that we're not actively cropping and it shouldn't be cropped. There's total room for a cattle enterprise. And we would love to find a young person that wants to stand up a cattle enterprise and work with us on that. Um, yeah, you want to do this? So, so one of the things we're excited about continuing our partnership with Iroquois Valley is as we move people through our apprentice program, we intend to incubate them onto their own farm operation or onto a standalone unit that they can manage under our auspices. Either way, we're going to need some help with the land acquisition. There are 250,000 acres of land retiring from this CRP program in Montana over the next two years. That land is either going to be farmed our way or the other way, and uh, we don't want to see that. We want to take as much of that on as we can and, and get more people on the land and more importantly get, get better stewardship of the land. So we look forward to, to your help in making that happen. So part of building our team, yeah, maybe we'll skip back. that. Well, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> go back. Go back. Oh, yeah, so, so just real fast story, part of building our team, this is Joe, his grandfather had land that went all into CRP, the farm next to us. Joe wrote us from prison three years ago because he wanted to take care of his family's land when he was getting out. You know, my, drug stuff, nothing like um, terrible. <laughs> so anyway, we wrote Joe back and he didn't know we had this apprentice program. So we got into the apprentice program and he's like, man, that's really hard work. You guys are crazy. I don't really want to be a farmer, but I love fixing stuff. So he's now enrolled in the diesel mechanics program at Montana State University Northern and we're grooming him to be our mechanic. So I think like he's got this funny look on his face because I was in the tractor and our joke is, is with this new uh, maintenance truck that we just bought. I go, I, Joe, I got a code orange. I have code orange. Something's broken. Please come. <laughs> so anyway, that's just a fun local story that we have where we're trying to grow some more employees. So just a couple big picture philosophical questions that we have. So, you know, our independent family farms, I think we all really hold this vision totally tight and dear, and this is what we want to see in the future. Um, given our experience of working with the next generation over the last five years, we think we have to come up with a different model that's going to allow people to have a career path into agriculture like what Doug and I are doing. Um, this younger generation is different uh, vision of risk, different vision of commitment, and the resources are totally different than what Doug and I had when we started at the time of 40. So, you know, what is another way to incubate? Go ahead, Claire. So, you know, we also have this sense of urgency. I talked a little bit about climate change. You know, how can we scale up and transfer knowledge fast enough to really make a difference? Like, this is where soil carbon sequestration is going to happen. It's on our prairies. And um, we're just psyched that you guys are thinking about this, and we need more of us doing that. And then just ending. Any questions? Our favorite quote. I knew it, black beluga lentil salad. It's all. <laughs> yeah, Andy. Uh, I'm just curious. You guys are doing things really different, and I think uh, so. I'm, just, I'm thinking about who else do I know on the plains that are trying to look at things very different, and I think of Wes Jackson and the folks at the Land Institute. So I guess I would just like to ask. Mm. How do you interact, do you interact with folks like that, even if not directly, at least in your head and in your theory and in your thinking and all that kind of stuff? Because it seems to me, just from the standpoint of trying to ask new questions, mm -hmm. look at things differently, you have the same mentality that folks at Land Institute have. One of the advantages of starting a farm when you're 40 is I had 20 years before that to um, build a knowledge base and uh, I, I spent time as an organic inspector and a certifier and went to a lot of conferences and visited I think I was up to like 150 different organic farms but um, to answer your question directly yeah I, I deeply value Wes and his work and the Land Institute I think they've got some some really good ideas um, you know Wendell Berry is another mentor of mine um, Fred Kirschman so, I know about Wendell Berry. So. Yeah, um, Fred Kirschman is sort of the Plains version. Uh, 
those three musketeers, if you will, uh, and Fred's visited our farm, and, and uh, I've visited his, and we've learned a lot. Uh, you know, uh, Bob Quinn, the founder of Kamut, is another mentor that we, we work with very closely, and so no, I, most of the ideas you see on our place are not original. We've taken a lot from, from many places and people and tried to create a system that, that appears to be unique, and, and we think it is in, in terms of the integration. But, uh, you know, farming is a learning experience, and each season teaches you more, sometimes in a good way, sometimes not so good. But uh, the more farms you can visit, the more you can talk to, the more you, more you have to learn. And, do you folks see a crop coming that looks like it might be, it might compete with wheat and other, do you see a crop on the horizon that might be a cash crop going forward that is just developing now? Or? Well, um, yes, but not a crop. I, I think the answer is we're, we're growing um, 18 crops this year. We, we generally grow between 15 and 20 crops every year, and a dozen or more of those will be for harvest, the others strictly as green manures. And, and I believe that's the answer. There is no silver bullet. You Have know. you read Dan Barber's The Third Plate, where he talks about, so Dan Barber, chef, stone barn, he, he talks about rotation. And, and he has like, um, oh, what's it called? He has a risotto that he makes out of crops that are not prairie wheat. Pra and I, well, I've been making prairie risotto where I make it out of lentils and barley and other things that are not wheat or rice. And so it's a way to how do you find how do you find restaurants and increase the public consumption of crops that are also need to be cash crops, not just one cash crop off of a farm. Okay. Well, we look forward to. Sharing dinner and any other questions, we love conversation.